Healing Hands Health Society presents Dental Webinar Series. We have planned a series dental webinars to keep you abreast of current practice. This series on prosthodontics will be via Zoom, Facebook Live. Presenters are drawn from dental schools in the USA, private practitioners from around the world. To register for future webinars, visit www.hhands.org backslash dental dash training. For future inquiries, contact facilitator all right uh, welcome to dental webinar series today we have uh, the privilege of having dr karen benny all the way from pretoria south africa welcome dr karen thank you <laughs> how do you how do I, your, your last name is benny it's benny benny okay anyway uh, we're going to learn more a little bit about uh, uh, Okay, Betty. In a few, just going to go to a bio. Let's read something about her. How is that? What's the what's the weather like? What 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 time of what? Uh, Today, what? One of the first spring days that we've had this year. It's fantastic weather outside today. Oh, nice, nice. <laughs> Exciting. Nice. That is good. Anyway, I'm going to yes. Like I said, welcome, welcome from um, Nepal, from Ethiopia, from Nigeria, from London, from South Africa, uh, you know, uh, United States. I want to say thank you, guys. This is making my day, you know, that, uh, you know, people are interested in just, you know, updating their knowledge and listening and, and, and coming together as a dental community, even in the time of a pandemic where we're supposed to be isolated. This um, webinar series has given us an opportunity of coming together, and I truly appreciate it. Dr. Okay, Kerry, I want to say thank you for your willingness to participate uh, in this webinar series. Dr. Kerry Benny is, um, received a Bachelor in Dental Surgery degree and completed a postgraduate diploma in aesthetic dentistry at the University of Pretoria. She went on to complete a master's degree in endodontics and prosthodontics at the University of Witwatersrand, and she's Currently, a specialist consultant at the University of Pretoria. Dr. Bini has published several articles and presented her research both locally and internationally. She's the winner of the 2013 Unilever Hatton Award for the South African Division of the IADR and two poster awards at the International College of Prosthodontists by annual, uh, biannual meetings in 2013 and 2015. Her clinical interests are broad. Uh, including both conventional and maxillofacial prosthodontics. Her current research interests in, include uh, gerontology, uh, implant maintenance, leadership diversity in dentistry. Dr. Kerry Benny from Pretoria, South Africa. Welcome. Thank you very much, Uvo. Uh, now, uh, let me see if I can share the screen of mine again. All right, are you seeing, oh heavens, hold on, I've now pressed the wrong button here again. Can you see my screen? Yes, good. All right, fantastic. Okay, guys, um, thank you very much for having me on this webinar series, Uber. I'm quite excited to be here, and I've attended a few of the Previous presentations, they've been fantastic. We were just discussing some of them earlier and really it's uh, such a privilege to actually present here. And um, today I'm going to talk to you a little bit about uh, treatment decisions, complications and implant maintenance. And really I just want to share with you a couple of cases that sort of changed the way I think about implant dentistry and, and really about um, dentistry as a whole. And really made me reflect on some of the treatment decisions, some of which were my own. That, and how they affected, sometimes negatively, sometimes positively, affected my patients. So um, it's a little bit unconventional to share your, your mistakes, but I believe that it's always a good learning experience. And so that's what I'm going to do today. All right. For some other reason, I can't move on to the next slide. Here we go. All right. So as we know, our treatment decisions, they can affect the future. They affect our patient's future, their tissues, their implant-supported prostheses. And we know that sometimes those treatment decisions can result in complications or maintenance events. Now, it's not to say that complications only result because of treatment decisions, but certainly sometimes our decisions can play a role 
in resulting in complications. Those events can be either technical or they can be mechanical, like um, veneer fractures or screw loosenings, and they can be biological, like peri-implant mucositis. And the reality is, is that some of these, these complications are very predictable. So we know, for example, when we've got an overdenture, at some point in time in the future, we're going to have to replace a worn matrix, or we're going to have to realign the opposing denture. But some of these complications are a lot more um, difficult to know what to do with. And or, you know, they, they are predictable. We know it can happen, but they're untoward. We sort of hope and pray they don't happen. And when they happen, they can obvious, obviously they can present in such an individualistic manner that you don't actually know how to manage it or how, if you, how you're managing it is the correct decision. So when that happens, we often go to the literature and we think, well, you know, what does the literature say on this topic? So about a year ago, I decided to do a PubMed search over the last 30 years, and I included all the medical subject headings related to implant dentistry. And I got about 30,000 articles. And of course, when you're faced with a clinical scenario and you're making a clinical decision, you want to know that you've got a clinical, a good quality clinical article. So you want a controlled clinical trial or at least a clinical trial. And you'd like that to have at least a minimum of five years follow-up so that you know what you're doing is going to last a while. And preferably you'd like life tables or some kind of yearly follow-up. You don't want to just see a time zero and time five years this is what happened because a lot could have happened in between and you'd like to know more or less what the event rate would be. So this is the type of article you're looking for. Now, when you get those articles, there's plus minus about five, 600 that I could find of those kinds of articles. And now you go and read those results in those articles and you'll find that very few articles actually give the details of the management of their complications with follow-up. So in other words, when you get um, an implant, the di most distal implant and a fixed implant supported prosthesis fails a year after delivery and they decide to remove it and they section the prosthesis and then they you know, place the prosthesis back and at year three, four, five, there were no further complications or they had a veneer fracture in the first year and they did a chair side repair and it didn't fracture again for the next five years, etc. And I found that there were about 300 of those articles. But the reality is, is that when you go and look at those articles and they give you real follow-up and real details and they go into the biological and the technical complication, there's probably only less than 100 articles that actually go into that. And when you're sitting with a situation like that and you're not really sure if you're making the right decisions, it's not practical to sift through 30,000 articles in the hope that you'll find something that's going to tell you you're on the right track. So we end up going to our experts and we ask the people we trust that have a lot of experience, what would they do in those cases? Now, one could argue, why don't you go and look at case studies? Well, I've, I've got always a little bit of a problem with case studies because it's, it's people that you don't always know. And it's often biased. You know, we, we, we publish, we tend to publish the things that worked out. We don't always want to publish or share the things that don't work out. So you don't know how often this treatment has worked out. So I'm always a little bit wary of those. Okay, so let me start sharing with you some of my patients. Um, this was a patient, she was 81 years old. She attended our dental implant maintenance clinic when I was still a very fresh resident a few years ago. And she actually came in because she had this uh, fracture. Oh, there we go. Sorry. Don't know why we have this problem, but it doesn't seem to. There we go. That's right. She had a fracture of the veneer on the one three tooth. And uh, you can see that there are, you know, there's a lot of other problems here. I mean, there's some maintenance issues, you know, a lot of plaque retention. There's some de decay, there's tooth surface loss. I mean, there's some evidence that she's got dry mouth. Etc. She's got lack of posterior support. So like any good resident, you go and you do your homework and you find out how we got here. And so she had four implants placed in the maxilla. She lost her teeth due to decay. She had four implants placed in the maxilla about 10 years prior to that appointment. And they'd given her an implant overdenture. And she wore the overdenture when she was eating and she 
would when she had visitors, but sometimes she'd get a little bit uncomfortable and then she'd take it out and she'd forget where she placed it. And so she came to the clinic to look if there were some other options for her. And so you can see in the top right picture on your screen, um, they provided her with a fixed implant supported porcelain fused to metal prosthesis. And at the bottom, this is what she looked like on delivery. And she kept having all of these veneer fractures, porcelain veneer fractures, one after the other. And eventually after about a year, they decided, all right, let's strip the porcelain off. Let's put a composite veneer on and let's strip the porcelain palately, keep that metal framework, polish it nicely, because at least then she's sort of um, protruding or guiding on that metal surface in the hope that maybe her teeth won't wear so much and her veneers won't fracture so much. And when I saw her, this was the first time, this was about two years after they had replaced the, the prosthesis. She'd come in with that fracture. And so I did a medical history like any good resident would. And I found out that she'd had this sort of progressively worsening medical history. She'd had diabetes mellitus for many years. A few years prior, she'd had her lower left leg amputated. She was wheelchair bound. She had been on antihypertensives for many years. She'd recently also started taking warfarin. And she had this sort of um, medication-induced xerostomia. It wasn't yet a confirmed hyposalivation, but it was a xerostomia at that stage. She'd had a pacemaker placed. She'd also had this sort of chronic pulmonary edema over the last few years, and she had to go to the hospital every few weeks to have it drained. She'd actually ended up in ICU for one week at one stage with this pulmonary edema. She also complained that she felt like her dexterity was reduced and she complained that since she'd been in her wheelchair, it was difficult to get around. So it was difficult for her to get in and out of the bathroom to necessarily go and clean her teeth. And so really this evidence of a progressively worsening medical history and possibly even social history. All right. So again, I took a panoramic radiograph and I realized, look, one of the screws are missing and that that prosthesis should be sitting passively. Even though that screw is missing, the other three screws are available, there shouldn't be that gap between the framework and the implant. So clearly, the veneer fracture must be due to this framework that's not passive. So in that maintenance appointment that I saw her, I decided, right, she's got veneer fracture, she's got a positively um, non-passive prosthesis, number of other issues like hygiene problems and decay, tooth surface loss, and then this progressively worsening medical history, one of which caused hypersalivation. So what do we do for this? Well, first thing I wanted to do was sort out her oral hygiene. And um, so I sent her for oral hygiene maintenance and for instructions. And I also wanted to do a dietary um, analysis, you know, and a salivary analysis just to confirm a hypersalivation because that can affect obviously your oral hygiene maintenance. And then we decided, well, we need to somehow give her the prosthesis back and it needs to be passive. And so fortunately, she had what we call a passive abutment. It's a type of abutment that's made by a company in South Africa. And it's really very useful. It's this little abutment at the bottom right here. It's cemented onto your prosthesis. And if you've got minor issues with passivity, you can take these passive abutments off and you can re-cement them on a corrected model and so improve your passivity. So she had a minor vertical problem with the passivity, so we made a verification jig, we corrected her original model, and then I re-cemented the passives on, and I thought, wow, fantastic. My first case done, I was as happy as can be. And then she came back, and she came back four times throughout the following year with veneer fractures. And each time I'd have this sort of knee-jerk reaction, okay, chair side repair, okay, laboratory repair, okay, check the occlusion, make sure the occlusions are only on metal, et cetera, et cetera. And I, I really had this sort of knee-jerk reaction. And eventually I thought, well, you know what? She's obviously got parafunction, so let me make her an interocclusal appliance for nighttime wear, and I'll make her a, a lower chrome cobalt partial denture for daytime wear, and then we can still continue looking at her maintenance because she was still struggling with her oral hygiene maintenance. Sometimes it would be good, sometimes it would be bad, but it wasn't consistent. And I thought, all right, so I've taken care of the posterior support and I've taken care of the parafunction. We should be good now. And then she came back with this and my heart broke. I mean, when you see a veneer fracture, a, a framework fracture like this, and it's a prosthesis that's a few years old, in a patient that has had these implants for 10 years, 
you just feel terrible. And I actually ended up taking out three implants at that stage. Three of the implants were fractured along with the prosthesis. And I mean, you can see even her teeth. I mean, it had still deteriorated, that tooth surface loss, that poor oral hygiene maintenance. It was just shocking, actually. This was the panoramic radiograph, just to show you, to confirm what you've already seen. And so what did I learn from this case? When I was reflecting now, this was sort of one of the first cases I did, what, what could I learn? I learned there's a reason why things go wrong. And you really need to do your homework very, very well. Don't have knee-jerk reactions. Collect as much information as you can from the beginning. If you've got access to old records or a colleague that previously treated the get as much information as you can. I also learned that patients change. The, the older they get, the less dexterity they have, the less they're able to maintain things, the sicker they get, the more polypharmacy they have. And, and it's, maybe it wasn't the right decision at that stage of her life to go from an overdenture that was working relatively well. I mean, one could argue that it was and it wasn't. But maybe that wasn't the right time of her life to go to, over to a fixed implant supported prosthesis. And I think that our, our treatment plan should reflect the change that patients are going to go through. I think when we come up with these elaborate treatment plans, somewhere at the bottom, we should write there that, you know, the patients are going to change and things are unscheduled, things are going to happen and we need to sort of reflect those changes. And I think also with this particular case, maybe I should have at some point in time rather gone back and said, well, what was the last prosthesis that worked relatively well in her mouth? It was an overdenture. Maybe I should have jumped in sooner and put her back in an overdenture. And at least then we would have still had an implant supported overdenture. In the end, I ended up making her a mucosa born denture, which she only wore when she was eating. She was a lovely lady, really was quite you know, good about it. And uh, the question I still ask myself is, was she better off? And I, I don't think she was better off. All right. Second patient that I want to share with you today is not actually an implant maintenance case per se. She was in the middle of treatment when one of the residents had finished and I took over the case. Um, but she actually came to the implant maintenance clinic about six months after the provisional had delivered, been delivered. And... Um, she came in because she had the sort of irritation around one of the implants. But what you can see here is that in some oral hygiene maintenance issues, there's some salivation issues, hyposalivation issues. You can see that the screw access holes of all of the implants are showing. You can see that there's a zygomatic implant in the top right-hand quadrant of the patient's mouth. You can see that there's a fractured provisional prosthesis here. What you can't see in this photograph is that she had this inflammatory reaction around the head of that zygomatic implant. It was so painful, I couldn't actually reflect it to take a photograph, but um, trust me, it was there. So this is the picture from the occlusal view. Again, you can appreciate the fracture of that prosthesis. And what you can also see is that she was missing this right maxillary arch. And so this patient's history is as follows. She had a squamous cell carcinoma of her right orbit. It had been exenterated um, about seven years prior to this appointment. And then she had a recurrence two years after that in the right maxilla, and they did a right hemimaxillectomy. And they did a fan flap to close this area. And they extracted all of her maxillary teeth and sent her off for radiation. And about a year after her radiation, they sent her off to the dental clinic and said, please make the patient a denture. And I think we can all appreciate that it would be almost impossible to get a mucosa support denture in this patient. So our craniofacial team at that stage decided, well, let's see if we can do implants for her. And they could because she'd only received 50 gray of radiation to the right side of her maxilla. So they planned four root, infill, uh, root form implants in the left maxilla and one zygomatic implant in the left zygoma. And this worked really well. It was a, a good multidisciplinary case. Unfortunately, they lost the implant in the 2-1 region at exposure. But they delivered a prosthesis. And after I repaired the prosthesis, I took some photographs. And I could see from the photographs that she had this, in repose, this very gummy tooth show. And this sort of scrunched up mentalis muscle. 
And you can see she had a very, very high smile line. And this was her smiling conservatively. She was an incredibly happy, um, boisterous patient. So this was a conservative smile for her. And you can see those scraxis holes. They were visible. But remember, she came in for the pain around the zygomatic implant. And what I realized is despite really good quality planning, unfortunately, the implant was placed just a little bit too labial and it hadn't been angled properly. If it had just been angled a quarter of a turn deeper, our screar access hole there would have come out on the palatal surface. And similarly, the other screar access holes were obviously facially placed. We would have wanted them to you know, be placed a little bit more palately as well. So we had this sort of inflammatory area, we had a poor aesthetic area, we had a vertical dimension of occlusion that was probably wrong, which we could see from one of those previous photographs with the mentalis muscle that was all scrunched up. And we needed to correct these issues in a definitive prosthesis. So where do we go from here? Well, we went to some experts and my professor said to me, right, you know what? We need to shift this restorative platform and we need to bury the head of that implant, get it away from that labial sulcus because that's causing her so much inflammation. So we made a customized abutment with a little screw hole there that we placed a conical abutment into. And then our surgeons had a beautiful connective tissue graft there for us. And that really got that inflammatory reaction away from that mobile tissue. And then we realized that we were going to have to close the vertical dimension of occlusion or reduce the vertical dimension of occlusion. And we were going to have to give her an overdenture, partly for better tissue support, but also partly because um, we wanted to hide those anesthetic uh, square access holes. And so you can see only three of the implants here are part of the bar. And if you were at Ugo's last lecture last week, you'd know about restorative space. You need a lot of restorative space when you're going to do a bar. And we just didn't have enough of it the more, more distal we went. But we had to do a bar because we've got a zygomatic implant. And with that long lever, you want to splint that zygomatic implant to at least two other implants adjacent to it. So we had to unfortunately do a bar. But you can see the most distal implant just had a little ball attachment. Okay. Again, evidence that we've got very little restorative space. You can see those housings through the palate. But this is about, you know, we've had this prosthesis in for about five years now. She needs a new prosthesis, but she's, you know, doing, she did well on this prosthesis. She was happy with it. Okay. So we can see from the top left to the top right a far better tissue support, far better appearance and repose. And that smile is just far more natural in the bottom right. Okay, so what did I learn from this case? I learned that despite our best efforts and despite working multidisciplinary teams, we have challenging reconstructions. And to pretend that things are not going to go wrong is very unrealistic. Sometimes things are going to go wrong and you are going to still have some complications. But you can retrieve that often. And you, in this scenario, we retrieved it with custom-made components. I've seen other cases where they've also used custom-made components. But they are, if you think laterally, if you think outside the box, and you consult people that have experience, you can come up with a plan to retrieve a situation. And I mean, if you are attending uh, lectures like this, you've got access to so many people that can help you and can give you experience to help you come up with retrieval situations when you have um, scenarios that are similar to this. So it's really a fantastic platform. Okay. And also learned that multidisciplinary treatment planning is so important. You know, when you do things from the start in a team, you've got all of those people invested in making it work and it can work. All right. The third patient I'd like to um, share with you is a patient that had had an implant supported cement retained prosthesis from the 1 1 to the 2 3, placed about 12 years prior to the first time I saw her. She had needed a root canal treatment on her tooth 2 4, and she'd come into the undergraduate clinic. And unfortunately, there'd been a, a complication during the endodontic treatment. They sent the patient to our periodontal team, they extracted the tooth, they placed a very nice implant. And whilst they were making a provisional prosthesis during the impression phase, the, the cement retained prosthesis from the 1-1 to the 2-3 actually came loose, but they couldn't remove it. So they sent it to us and said, I don't you want to just remove that prosthesis for us? And we couldn't remove it. We all tried, even our professors tried, it was stuck. And so now what do you do? 
So fortunately, we had an old panoramic radiograph and we could see that those implants, if you can see quite nicely, there's the sort of radiolucent shadow and you can see that where those screw access holes would have come out if this was a cement retained prosthesis, okay? Because now we've got to try and remove this prosthesis by drilling through the prosthesis and gaining access to the abutment screws. And so you can see that this implant would have come out sort of mesial of the one one, this one sort of between the one, the two one and the two two, this one sort of mesial of the two three. And knowing the anatomy of your anterior maxilla, you know that that palatal bone is often nice, good quality bone. And if you're placing straight implants and you're not grafting, chances are your implant screw access holes are going to come out facially. Fortunately, we had a CBCT that confirmed this. So we could take a fairly good estimation of where we needed to drill so that we could get access to these screws. And we did. And I removed this prosthesis and I realized it was a loose abutment. We tightened it up. What you can also see from this picture is the significant amount of soft tissue inflammation under this prosthesis. And the patient actually said, you know, she never really cleaned under it because she could never really get access um, underneath it. And she never even flossed between it and, and the, the teeth. It was just so frustrating. And this could indicate why she had cavities on the one, two, and why she probably had the carious lesion on the two, four that resulted in the original endodontic treatment. So after this, I closed it all up with a bit of composite. It doesn't, it hasn't got a great aesthetic result, but as a provisional, it will do. But really we know we've got this cement retained prosthesis that is now got screw access holes. It's not really looking great. It's not really a long-term prosthesis for her. We've got this terrible soft tissue inflammation. The patient can't really clean underneath it, which is just criminal. And what are we going to do? And while well, we decided, well, there's a number of ways you could handle this, but there were four implants replacing five teeth. Maybe part of the reason she couldn't clean it was because there were just so many implants. So maybe we needed to bury some of the implants. And we were just lucky in that the two implants that were best placed to get palatal screw access holes were the most mesial implant and the most distal implant. And we were lucky that this was a relatively short edential span. So we could then bury the two middle implants and deliver a provisional prosthesis on the implant on the two one, the one one and the two four. And then we were gonna wait for the tissues to settle, wait for her to show that she can clean underneath it and ultimately then make her definitive. And so you can see here, we buried those two middle implants. And these were the two implants that had access holes that we could get to come out palatally and we used them. And yes, our screw retained provisional prosthesis. And, and I prefer a screw retained prosthesis wherever I can because of the maintenance. If you go and read in the literature, there's some people that are very divided on the issue. There's some systematic reviews that show absolutely no difference between the two. But I can tell you when it comes to retrievability and it comes to managing complications and maintenance events, having a screw retained prosthesis is just so much easier. All right. So we thought this is great and we were going to have this whole situation sorted out in a few months. Unfortunately, when that inflammation went down and the tissues healed, one of the implants became exposed. And so now what do you do? So our options were we could do a soft tissue graft, leave the provisional prosthesis in again, and then deliver a definitive. But unfortunately, that was another surgery for her. We could also put an angled abutment on it and actually use that implant. Um, that might have made cleaning a little bit more difficult, uh, which was one of the reasons why we buried it in the first place. But the other issue with angled abutments is that the angular correction occurs supracrestally. So if you've got a high smile line and a supracrestal angular, uh, angled abutment, supracrestal correction of angle with this um, abutment, you often see that titanium collar, and I'll show you a picture of that later. Fortunately, our patient had a low smile line, so this was definitely an option. Okay, and so this was a few years ago when we didn't have a lot of um, research on the dynamic abutments or these angle-corrected abutments. So I was a little bit wary of using something that there's not a lot of evidence for. There's still not all that much of evidence, but there's a lot more than we know about now. We know, for example, if you're talking it at an angle, you've got to talk it just a little bit more. But this certainly is an option now if we had the case today. 
Unfortunately, the patient had an aneurysm and she didn't return to the clinic again. So we never got a chance to, to finish this case. But these certainly are the options. Okay. Just to show you about that angular correction. So when you have a angled abutment like you have here on the left, that's, that angle, angular correction occurs supracrestally. And if you've got very little soft tissue and a high smile line, you're going to see this metal collar and then you really can't use it. And then these sort of dynamic abutments, because of that omnidirectional screw and screwdriver, you can um, torque those screws at different angles. So that angular correction won't necessarily be visible. All right, so those are one of the, the two options, or right, three options. So what did we learn from this case? I learned that there's many ways to skin a cat. All right, so you, you've got to look at all your different treatment options. I mean, it could have been bury the implants, could have been angled abutments, could have been angular correcting abutments, et cetera, et cetera. And what's going to help you make that decision is the various modifying factors. And one of the modifying factors for us initially was she was struggling to clean and we thought it might be because there were so many implants that she couldn't get in between all of them. And so that's the reason why we buried them. But then when minor complications occur, like one of those becoming, um, you know, becoming exposed, we now had to come up with another, another option. There were now a different set of modifying factors that we had to look at to come up with different options. And the reality is, is that when you're faced with these type of situations, you want to try to use what's available with, and try and avoid additional treatment or surgeries. Um, and that's not always possible, but you want to at least try if you can. All right. Last case, it's just a brief case. Excuse me, <laughs> the word. <laughs> um, this is a patient that had a mucoepidermoid carcinoma in the anterior maxilla. She'd had this resected and they placed two zygomatic implants for her. She was in her late 70s when this happened. About five years later, she'd had this sort of um, little bar with an implant supported obturator and she kept coming in for, for maintenance visits because the bar kept coming loose. And uh, then they decided, all right, they're gonna make her just a conventional obturator. And I got called in one day um, just recently to just have a look for patients, just to sort of have a look what's going on. And I just got the fright of my life when I saw this. It was just caked with plaque, these implants. And I looked at this patient, she was now in her 80s. She had been blind for a number of years. She was incredibly frail. We had a terrible communication problem. She didn't speak the language that we spoke. Um, we couldn't really communicate with her. She'd come from a sort of a fairly low socioeconomic status group, and she didn't really have a lot of money to be maintaining, you know, sort of complicated implant-supported prostheses. She really didn't even know what was going on in her mouth. She hadn't even seen these implants. You couldn't, you couldn't lift the lip up for her to really even see what was going on without using mirrors. And I just thought to myself at that stage, you know, there were a lot of soft tissue undercuts here. And there were probably a lot more teeth at the time of the resection. They were still available. She lost a few teeth in the last year or two. And I just wondered, you know, if, if it might not have been a better idea to go for a more conventional treatment plan from the start for this patient. If maybe zygomatic implants weren't the right option for this particular patient. And so, again, your treatment treatment decisions should reflect the needs of your patients. Just a different view to show you a little bit more the undercuts. You know, a bulb could have probably worked here quite well. All right, so in summary, our treatment decisions affect our, our patient's future. And often, not, all, not often, but sometimes our treatment decisions result in complications. It's certainly not the only reason why there are complications, but it can be one of them. And there are obvious maintenance events um, that are not really related to our treatment decisions, but they're obvious ones like the, re the replacement of matrices when they're worn. And then there are those sort of major maintenance events, those untoward ones. We know they can happen, they're in the literature, but you know, we don't really want them to happen. And when they do, we don't always sure how to manage them. There's a lot of literature in the dental implant um, uh, sphere and the reality is, is that there's very little data 
on whether we're making the right decisions when we manage these complications or treatment events. When there is information, they could lack details of the etiology. They could lack long-term follow-up, et cetera, et cetera. And it would really be impractical to go through 500 articles just to find one complication somewhere in a controlled clinical trial that has the same complication that you had. So we do often fall to our experts, to the people we trust that have a lot of experience, and we can learn from our cases. We can learn from the maintenance events that we had. And certainly I learned there's a reason why things go wrong. You have to find the reason. And that means you have to do a lot of detective work. You have to gather as much information as you possibly can. So going to your previous records, going to the special investigations, et cetera, et cetera. Taking time to sit and speak with your patient because they've got all the history. They remember how things went down. I also think it's important that you shouldn't repeat the same mistakes expecting different results. So I certainly had a few examples where I've had these knee-jerk reactions, like just repairing the veneer the whole time, hoping that it will work this time and hoping that it will work this time. And the truth is, is that sometimes it can be a process to figure out what's going wrong. Sometimes when you gather your information, you still need that veneer to fracture one or two times before you go, you know what, maybe we should change direction. Maybe we should take her back to an overdenture and see if that will work. All right. Sometimes despite our best efforts, things still go wrong. Sometimes we plan really well and we put all of the effort in and things still just don't go right. And those times it's often still retrievable and you can retrieve something if you learn to think a little bit outside the box and you consult the right people. So how do, did these cases affect me for the future? So for the patients that came in without implants that I was starting from scratch, well, I learned you, you reap what you sow. If you're not going to plan and be meticulous and really pay attention to detail at every step, somewhere down the line, something's going to come back to bite you. I also learned that when you're treating implant patients, case selection is important. So when our patients are getting older and they're starting to show evidence that there's progressive you know, medical problems or social issues, that you know, we need to be selective about whether these are the types of patients we go for complicated implant cases or whether we try and do things that are more easily maintainable, et cetera. I learned also that working with a team of different people with different specialities is really important and it makes it so much easier to make good quality decisions. I didn't cover this next point so much in the presentation, but you need to try and plan for the future. Wherever it's possible, you want to try and plan for failure. So in other words, if you've got someone coming in and you know that you're going to do a specific kind of treatment for them, you want to sort of think to yourself, when, you, when you're doing that treatment planning, what are some of the things that might go wrong in the future? And if that does go wrong, then what am I going to do? Then how am I going to fall back on it? Am I going to then, you know, section the prosthesis? Am I going to then do an overdenture, et cetera, et cetera. So you want to start as far as possible planning for failure. And obviously maintenance matters. That goes without saying. And lastly, I think an important thing that I've learned is the, the ability to reflect on your treatment decisions. So, you know, um, things don't always work out. They work out 90% of the time, but sometimes the best way to learn is to really think about the 10% of the time where it didn't work out. And I think that's quite an important lesson to learn. Thank you. That's it. <laughs> Heavens. Thank you so much, Doctor. It's a pleasure. Uh, any questions? Let's, if you have any questions, Ms. Um, uh, if you want to speak, let's, uh, these are really critical. I, I mean, because, you know, what, when we think about implants, we, 
the first thing that you want to do, you want to place implants, <laughs> but uh, it's like you need to maintain them. <laughs> yeah. I think that's a big portion of most of it. So I, I'm sorry, I, I like these lectures because they kind of give you a, a, full, a full view. Dr. Cooper. Good morning, Dr. Cooper. Hi. Yeah, sorry. I'm, I'm sorry to, to pick on you. I'm, I'm going to pick on you now. How essential is maintenance of, of implants? Um, you can't. Well, implants are a replacement for fit lost teeth. And our patients believe that this is a lifetime replacement. And we really have no evidence that implants can replace teeth for another lifetime. So the only way to assure longevity of our implant therapy is through continual and rigorous maintenance. So it's absolutely a part of therapy. Um, let, let me also be a little more philosophical here. We teach implant therapy as an acute intervention. We take out a tooth, we put in an implant, we do an immediate load procedure. It's a very acute clinical intervention. But the reality is what we're doing when we place an implant is we, can create, we are creating a chronic condition of a mild to severe inflammatory state around a titanium post sticking through someone's mucosa. Mm. So when we switch our thinking to implant therapy being a, the establishment of a chronic condition, we cannot ever assume that we could avoid maintenance of implants. So that's my long story. <laughs> anyway, thank you, thank you. That's that's that sums it up. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, we're looking forward to having you. Uh, you're going to speak next on on Sunday uh, on Saturday next week. We'll be having the yes. back on, and uh, it's it uh, promises. Like we said, that uh, the, this series are winding down, and we're, and we're whole, looking forward to having a course. Uh, hopefully, um, Doctor Benny, we can have you to come back and take the implant maintenance part of the course. So I believe that. Uh, not everybody has access to these lectures. Uh, I, I think what we have put together in the past three months, it's uh, when I look back, I, I'm really wondering, you know, there's nothing like that. Uh, people can yeah. go back there and learn. And uh, thank yeah. you for your willingness to participate. And uh, we have learned a lot and we'll look forward to uh, having you be a part of that course. Thank you very much, Uber. I really am enjoying your, your webinar series. Jeez, I've learned so much in the last few weeks. It's I wish I wish it was around when I was a resident. <laughs> I know, I know. You know, my, my classmates are always on there, you know, listening to, you know, because there's some things, to, I mean, the fact that we are learning from different people, different, ex, you know, people who have spent years of experience, yeah. you know, yeah. you know it, it, it's really something. Dr. Cooper, do you have any, uh, any, any tidbits for what, what are we going to be hearing for, or from you next week? Next week is um, a crash course in single tooth implants. Um, as an educator, we address the question of what are the things that everybody needs to know and, and what guidelines can we provide minimally and simply so even a novice can perform excellent single tooth implant therapy. We um, created these rules of six, which we're going to share with everybody and illustrate through different case demonstrations. And um, I can assure everybody who's listening and people who join us next week that if they follow these guidelines, um, they will have great success with single tooth implants and avoid the complications that we so frequently observe. Uh, I, you know, I, I'm going to just, uh, I, I know, I know we are, we are, we are, uh, this was impromptu, but I was going to ask, what would you say should be uh, for someone who is, uh, many people out here have not done implants before, they are looking forward to doing their first case. In terms of site selection, is, is there, you know, and then with, your, with the six rules, is it any site? Well, before we get to the rules, it's the patient, right? Um, pick a healthy patient that has no comorbidities. Don't, don't take a smoking diabetic patient as your first patient. Um, once you're beyond that and the patient, you can identify a healthy patient, I think there are some places that are a little bit easier to manage and learn from. I would say that a maxillary um, first premolar site is a very good place to begin. And I think a mandibular first molar site where the uh, extraction has not led to loss of buccal bone or severe resorption is also a very good place to begin. Um, largely because of 
so the, the ability to have access surgically, um, the forgivingness of um, minor discrepancies in implant placement and, and actually the ease of restoration help you as a clinician. But further, any limitations um, may be more acceptable to the patient. Uh, the central incisor is definitely not the place to begin with your first implant, right? It's definitely not the place. Maxillary <laughs> molars that, in, that involve dealing with the sinus can be challenging from, a, from, some, from some perspectives. But we'll talk about all of this. We'll talk about all of this next week. All right. Uh, so you, I, I, you, you, we need to tell our friends and our, our, our students, I know there are so many faculty members uh, uh, present here. There are folks from Nepal, uh, Saudi Arabia, Ethiopia, Kenya, or, or Nigeria, United Kingdom, who are on this call today, are looking forward to uh, you know joining to come and learn about the rules of six. I, uh, Dr. Cooper, I was reading recently. Sorry, uh, you know you are easy target today. I was reading the <laughs> rules of three. You wrote something called is it the rules of or, or the rule of ten? Yes, that's for treatment of the completely edentulous mandible. Yes, I, I, I yeah, saw my, that. My, for, my, my former residents tease me all the time that I have rules for everything. <laughs> <laughs> that, that, was, that was really instruct, you know, instructive when I was and, doing And that. once again, these rules are, you know, the, the, it's, it's often said, and it's very true, that rules are made to be broken. So these rules are guidelines, and it really helps one think very simply about things. You know, I joke around all the time, Uvo, that, Dentists only have five hand fingers on one hand. So when we make rules, they, they have to have one hand holding a dental instrument, but you can't have more than five rules because they run out of fingers to count them on. So we have to be very simple. <laughs> I know, I know. Anyway, yeah. thank you so much. I, you, you are really, you know, you continue to bring, uh, uh, you know, a lot of uh, spice uh, uh, to our program. Dr. Bini, uh, you have added, you have, you, have, you have raised the bar, you know, South Africa, you know, we're open to South Africa, and there's so many people from Zimbabwe, from Zambia, um, from Malawi, from Uganda who can identify. What, but I wanted to ask you, what implant system do you guys uh, uh, use mostly in, 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 in your country? Uh, so we've got a, a number of implant systems. There's um, Strauman's got quite a big footing here, but we've also got a, a South African company, Southern Implants, that's quite, quite big in South Africa. Obviously, they are very well priced in our, our market because it's a South African company. It's uh, one of their components that I was showing you earlier. So I, I use them quite a lot and Strauman as well quite a lot. Uh, we had Biomate 3i, MIS, a whole bunch of different companies. Okay. All right. Mm -hmm. I mean, if, if, if you don't mind, I, I'm, I'm looking forward to having, because I, I think industry support is key to um, the advancement of implant education anywhere. You know, so I'm hoping that that's the next phase. We need to start talking to those who are, uh, the manufacturers yes. to support the training because we need implants. People need to see them, and we can't wait for you to, you know, graduate. We, if we can catch them back in schools, that's that, that's where we are going. So, if you would uh, please uh, put me to the, you know, Southern Implant Web, yes. I would yes. like for them to come and present about the options, uh, you know, you know, things that they they do have uh, in their in their in, in their product line. Our, um, our company here, Southern Implants, is why I love working so much with them is because they just really are for the dentists and for the specialists. If you come up with a novel idea, they'll help you work it out. If you've got an implant component that isn't made anymore, they will make it for you. So they really are for the, the practitioners and for the patients. They're just spectacular. So I'll definitely get you in touch with those, those people. All right. Thank you so much. Uh, tomorrow, we're going to have... Um, uh, we're going to have... Um, Healing Hands Health Society presents Dental Webinar Series. We have planned a series dental webinars to keep you abreast of current practice. This series on prosthodontics will be via Zoom, Facebook Live. Presenters are drawn from dental schools in the USA, private practitioners from around the world. To register for future webinars, visit www.hhands.org backslash dental training. For future inquiries, contact facilitator 